Jordan's bank, the Baptist cry announces that the Lord is nigh. Awake and hearken, for he brings glad tidings of the King of kings. Then cleanse me every soul from sin, make straight the way for God within. Prepare we in our hearts a home where such a mighty guest may come. For thou art our salvation, Lord, our refuge and our great reward. Without thy grace we waste away like flowers that wither and We offer Mass this morning in loving memory and for the repose of the souls of Alfred Priest, Alfred Priest Jr., Yvonne Priest, and Robert Priest. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, <coughs> forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. O oh God, who see how your people faithfully await the feasts of the Lord's Nativity, enable us, we pray, to attain the joys of so great a salvation and to celebrate them always with solemn worship and glad rejoicing. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The desert and the parched land will exalt. The steppe will rejoice and bloom. They will bloom with abundant flowers and rejoice with joyful song. The glory of Lebanon will be given to them. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the hands that are feeble, 
Make firm the knees that are weak. Say to those whose hearts are frightened, Be strong, fear not. Here is your God. He comes with vindication, with divine recompense. He comes to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf be cleared. Then will the lame leap like a stag, then the tongue of the mute will sing. Those whom the Lord has ransomed will return and enter Zion singing, crowned with everlasting joy. They will meet with joy and gladness. Sorrow and mourning will flee. The word of the Lord. A reading from the book of the letter of St. James. Be patient, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient with it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You too must be patient. Make your hearts firm, because the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not complain, brothers and sisters, about one another, that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing before the gates. Take as an example of hardship and patience. Brothers and sisters, the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. The word of the Lord.
Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When John the Baptist heard in prison of the works of the Christ, he sent his disciples to Jesus with this question. Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? Jesus said to them in reply, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind regain their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news proclaimed to them, and blessed is the one who takes no offense at me. As they were going off, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out to the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? Then what did you go out to see? Someone dressed in fine clothing? Those who wear fine clothing are in royal palaces. Then why did you go out? To see a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. Amen, I say to you, among those born of women, there has been none greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. <laughs> Good morning. Your uh, pastors are away. Uh, I, I understand uh, they uh, went to uh, celebrate a wedding somewhere. Must be a long wedding. Uh, but I trust that uh, they had a joyful time and that they will, with our prayers, uh, will be returned to us um, safely. Today is the third Sunday of Advent. And by tradition, it's the second uh, of two Sundays when we take a look at the life and uh, the ministry of John the Baptist. Now, today's gospel reading is kind of long, and as I'm sure you've noticed, it has two parts. So for the sake of, well, I won't say brevity, because if you know me, I'm not quick. But uh, I'll look at uh, the first reading, or I encourage you to look at the first part of the, the reading. And um, if we understand that, the second part starts to make sense. The scene is that John the Baptist is in prison. And we all know he's going to die real soon. So he's sitting in prison, and he sends some of his disciples to go and ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? Now what he means is, of course, are you the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one who's going to save God's people? Kind of an odd thing to ask, don't you think? I mean, because John the Baptist is Jesus' relative, cousin. They've known each other for a while. And Jesus has been out and about doing some of his Messiah-type things. So you would think by now that John the Baptist would be pretty sure. But... Maybe that's what happens when you are about to die. You want to make sure that you pick 
the right one. Otherwise, besides you know, getting the answer wrong, like on a test in school, all those things that John the Baptist did and sacrificed, if he picked the wrong guy, it was all for nothing, including being in jail and suffering and, of course, dying. So I think we can understand. If he's about to die, he wants to be pretty sure that his life and his suffering were spent for the right reason. Now, if that's true, then Jesus' reply sent back to him also seems a little bit odd, don't you think? I mean, if I were asked a question by a dying man, not, are you the Christ, but, you know, Father Hal, uh, do you like chocolate, you know, or something like that, I would probably say, yes. On a good day, I might say, and make it dark chocolate, something like that. I try to answer the question. But instead of saying, yes, I am the Messiah, uh, Jesus instructs his messengers to go and give this long reply. Uh, and you heard it, right? Uh, the blind regain their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, dead are raised, and the poor have good news proclaimed to them. Why not just tell the poor man, yes, and set his mind at ease? Why go through this long process? Now, let's assume Jesus is not trying to be mean to a man who is going to die. And he's going to die because he said Jesus is the Messiah. If all John cared about was, did I get the answer right? Did I pick the right guy? Then it's kind of like, um, if you remember in school, or some of you are in school, and you took an, a, a test, you wanted to get the answer right. But then what happened? Unless you were a really good student, and that doesn't include me. I got the answer right, and then I forgot about it. Because if it was math or science or you know, some other unimportant subject, all I want is the grade, and who cares about what the answer really means? But of course, that's not the best way to choose correct things. And Jesus is not only telling his cousin, yeah, you got the answer right. But he's reminding John why it was important to get the answer right. Who is the Messiah? Not just who, but what the Messiah has come to accomplish. These things that Jesus lists, even though they're in kind of old-fashioned language, they're still part of our lives today. And though our list might be bigger, what do we have in common with these people? These are examples of physical ailments that cause people suffering. Now, that might be direct pain for our bodies, it might also mean pain because these things make our relationship with other people difficult or impossible. So for example, if you, you know, it's possible if you can't see, then it might be harder to get a job. If you can't uh, walk, it might be that you can't marry the person you really like because they won't want you because you can't walk. And if you're dead, well, that poses many difficulties to getting the things that you want. So these things that cause people pain and suffering, first to their bodies and then to their lives, because they can't make their lives work the way they want to. Maybe you know something about that. So you want to be healed of these things. But Jesus is telling John and us to dig even deeper. He already knows that human beings suffer a lot. And of course, one of the reasons why we are Christians is that we believe that the Son of God knows what it means 
to be in pain and to suffer. But when Christ suffers or when Christians suffer, there's something very important about that suffering. And Jesus is pointing out sort of like, you know, the good side and the bad side. The good side, and I use the word in quotes, the good side is for Christians who suffer with Christ, we know that it counts for something. In other words, if I have a pain in my arm or in my eyes, or there's pain in my relationships, if I offer these things to God, somehow God will, either in my own life or in the lives of other people, make a difference. In other words, if my suffering means nothing, then why should I bother? But if my suffering will somehow add to my life or add to someone else's, then there's something good to be had. A, a simple example, I'm sure parents teach children this all the time. You know, if they have some kind of, you know, pain in their hand, for example, they say, now you know what it's like for that girl over there who has a pain. So you can be nice to her, that kind of thing. We usually call it sympathy. But Jesus wants us to dig even deeper than that. And he's telling his cousin, it's not just that you got the answer right. Remember what happens when people suffer too much. And it's not just about our bodies. It's not even just about our relationships and how they can become wrecked. What's worse than that, you might say? The worst thing is, and this is why the Messiah has come and why it's so important to get it right, is that people, maybe like you or me, if we suffer too much, we can decide, you know this God, he's useless. He's not helping me. So I don't need him anymore. The Messiah is here first to remind us, if we choose this, and it is our choice, our suffering will not only grow greater, but it will be forever. Now, we might not believe that's true, but the Son of God knows. He knows human nature. He knows divine nature, because he's both. And he's saying, you think suffering in this world is bad, with your eyes or your ears or your hands, but I'm here to prevent you from making the really fatal mistake of pushing God away, and then their suffering will be terrible. He's telling John the Baptist, remember why you are going to suffer, or you're already suffering, and die for me. Not just so that we can give people a little bit of joy for a short time, but give them the greatest joy, which is an eternal life with Christ. Now, Catholics should really, really hold on to this. Because, of course, many people in the world are looking for happiness. Many people in the world believe in God. But Catholics believe that when we participate in these sacraments, whether today's Eucharist or going to confession, and there are others, if you've been to CCD, you know what those others are, we believe that the life of Christ enters into us right now. So in addition to uh, waiting for something good in the future, resurrection from the dead, perhaps the power to rejoice more fully, yes, that, maybe that's in the future. But we're not just waiting around doing nothing. We are receiving right now the life and the power of God, which will take root and make a home in our hearts unless we do this to God. And we can. We are free to do it if we want to. But unlike ancient Jews, the good ones, the faithful ones, the ones who listened and read their Bibles, they were promised one day in the future, God will deliver you. But right now, <laughs> your life is just suffering. 
So hang in there, read the Bible, obey the commandments, and maybe someday your life will be better. For Catholics, yes, we still have the promise of growing, of becoming better people, having a better life, but that starts right now with the power and the life that is offered. So when you come up to receive Holy Communion, whether in the hand or on the tongue, please, please come to receive the life of Christ now. And if we're looking for a way to get a handle on this, and sometimes, you know, I have to remind myself, okay, so it's getting cold outside, it's getting dark, some people don't like me, my life is looking kind of rotten. Why should I rejoice, as the Bible keeps telling me? One of the key, I don't want to call it a trick here, but one of the most important things to remember, and perhaps you teach your children this, is the difference between two kinds of joy. And this season, and the one that follows, Christmas, reminds us not to cheap out and settle for the small joy, but go for the big prize. Small joy is when you get what you want, like at Christmas. When you, you say to your mom and dad, I want, well, what do kids want these days? Do they want an iPhone or are they still looking for the Porsche? I don't know what, what children want these days. But whatever it is, they say, I want this, I want this, I want this. If they get it, we're happy. They don't get it, I hate you. Or something like that, right? I mean, I think it's a little bit different now, but that's what we used to do. That's the small joy. Getting what you want. The problem with the small joy is even if you get it, it goes away pretty quickly. Whether it's a gift in the hand or even people. You know, I want this girlfriend, I want that friend, I want... Even if we get them, sometimes they go away. Either because they go away from us or we get tired of them and we throw them away. Whatever it is, the small joy goes away fast or slow, and then what happens? We're miserable again. The greater joy, the joy that the Messiah, the Christ, is interested in giving us, the kind that God has, is not about getting what we wanted, what we said we wanted, what we begged people for. You might say, well, then what, else, what other kind of joy is there? The greater joy is receiving from God his joy that is placed in us. And what that means is he knows who we can become. After all, he did create us. Or to use a bad modern phrase, he knows our potential. He knows very well that people throw away their potential all the time. But the Messiah and his helpers, like John the Baptist, are willing to risk even suffering and death so that instead of the small and somewhat stupid joys that we keep clamoring for, we will open our hearts and let God put into them his joy. And if that's still a little bit vague, I'm going to appeal to parents because you know this better than I do. If you see that your children whether small or kind of grown up, are wasting their lives. Doesn't that make you sad? Um, I'm not talking about parents who want to control their children. Not, not that kind. If, the, if you're that kind, then you're bad. You need to you know, change. But if you know that your children could grow up to use their intellects, their hearts, in huge ways, and right now they're doing things that are going to ruin their lives, doesn't that make you sad? If there were a way for you to put into their minds and hearts your knowledge of how great they could become and your rejoicing, your happiness in them, not because they did stuff for you, but just because they grew up to be the biggest, most loving, most powerful people they could be, if you could put that 
vision and joy in their hearts. And they could say, wow, this is great. I never knew I could do this. I never knew I could be this. But thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. Now I see my potential. If you see how that kind of joy works, even if you, you know, see it just a little, you know what the eternal joy of human beings received from God feels like. When we stop saying, I want this, I want this, I want this, and we start opening our lives and asking God to put that joy, his vision, his knowledge of our full potential and the way to get it into our hearts and minds, that's when we start to taste and live God's kind of joy. That's why the Catholic Church shamelessly says throughout all the year, but in Advent and Christmas when it's cold and dark, rejoice. And you might say, well, look at my life. Why should I rejoice? God's answer is, hey, put aside the small details of your suffering. And we say, small? And he says, yes, small. And let me put into that body and mind my power, my mind, my heart, and my joy. And then see what kind of life you live. It's hard for children when they say, I want an iPhone. And you say, I'm going to give you a multivitamin. <laughs> now, we know which one, or OK, forget multivitamin. How about you know, broccoli, kale, and spinach? How about that? We know which one is going to make the body better. But children, OK, it may take some time. That's what it's like for God to say, rejoice. Follow the Christ, obey the commandments, and you will live. Get it right. In other words, make sure you know which Messiah you're following. Make sure we know what is at stake, what's really at stake here. And then follow John the Baptist, your patron, St. Jude, you know, all these people who went to their deaths and think once again of, John the Baptist, in a cold, dark, wet dungeon, knowing he's going to die very soon. But when these words of the Messiah reach him, the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, John knows in his heart, my life was worth it. My suffering was worth it. God has put his joy in my heart, and now I am alive. They can kill me tomorrow, but I will live. Not just that. I have helped other people hear that they can live. So live or die, I am God's. As Catholics, we should not settle for the cheap joys. Oh yeah, you can get your presents and open them. I'm gonna get mine, I know that. Uh, whether I give any, that's something else. But if I'm going to be a Christian and enjoy Advent and Christmas, I must, in my heart, hunger for the greater, greatest joy, which is the mind and the heart and the spirit and the life of God placed in me so that we can say, well, first of all, we can say, thank you, God. And thank you because in your love for me, now I see the person I can become. And now I really want to help those around me know this power to live in God's life, his love, and yes, his real joy. Now, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. But first, let us profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. 
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things are made. <coughs> for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the Pope's monthly intention, we pray that volunteer nonprofit organizations committed to human development find people dedicated to the common good and ceases, ceaselessly seek out new paths to international cooperation. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Bishop Sean, that he will rejoice at the right of acceptance with all those who are preparing for full communion this year, especially Charles and Jerry. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our soldiers and all essential workers who serve during the holidays, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who are sick and in distress in any way, especially those listed in the bulletin, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who have died, for Alfred Priest, Alfred Priest Jr., Yvonne Priest, and Robert Priest. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. <coughs> Almighty God, we thank you for your many gifts. Open our hearts to receive your Son so that we may know your joy flowing and growing in our hearts. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Thy 
thy people to deliver. Born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever. Now thy gracious kingdom bring by thine own eternal spirit. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands. We praise the glory of his name for our good and the good of all of his holy church. May the sacrifice of our worship, Lord, we pray, be offered to you unceasingly to complete what was begun in sacred mystery and powerfully accomplish for us your saving work. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord, for he assumed at his first coming, the lowliness of human flesh, and so fulfilled the design you formed long ago and opened for us the way to eternal salvation, that when he comes again in glory and majesty and all is at last made manifest, we who watch for that day may inherit the great promise in which now we dare to hope. And so with angels, and archangels, with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather people to yourself so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and the blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, 
Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven. And as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your son and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph and her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with Saint Jude, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence, we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant, Francis, our Pope, and Sean, our bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O oh God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us, us from, from evil. Amen. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the 
of the kingdom, power, and glory are yours now. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us share with one another a sign of God's peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. We implore your mercy, O Lord, that this divine sustenance may cleanse us of our faults and to prepare us for the coming feasts. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. A couple of announcements, and this is in the bulletin. Um, there will be, I understand, a Santa brunch uh, next Sunday, December 18th at 11.30, so right after this Mass. Um, you can read about the yummy uh, menu items. Um, but it says that prepaid tickets are $5 per person or $15 per family. So somebody's going to be somewhere back there uh, to offer you tickets on the way out if you'd like to come and uh, participate next weekend. And I definitely picked the wrong weekend to be here. So uh, you all enjoy that next weekend uh, with your pastors. On the second announcement, it's not exactly an announcement, but just in case any of the younger people were listening to my homily and get the wrong impression, you still have to obey your parents, okay? So your parents, you know, sometimes don't do what you like, but just in case you were about to say, the priest said, okay, the priest said, you still have to obey your parents until you're paying rent and car insurance, okay? So that's what the priest says. So if parents don't like that, well, we can talk about that later. Okay. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth that the Mass is ended. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. Speak of peace, thus says our God. Comfort those who sit in darkness, mounting neath their sorrows low. Speak unto Jerusalem of the peace that waits for them. Tell her that her sins I cover and is crying in the, the desert far and near, bidding all men to repentance, since the kingdom now is here. Oh, let warning cry away, now prepare for God away. Valleys rise to meet him, and the hills bow down to greet him. Yea, her sins our God will pardon, blotting out each dark misdeed. All that well deserved his anger, he will no more see nor heed. She has so Into ever springing gladness.